In this video, I'm going to explain truth value and the principle of bivalence. I'll also explain why the principle of bivalence is important in propositional logic, how it's related to the law of excluded middle, and problems people might have with it. For the purposes of this video, let's say that a proposition is a claim about reality. I realize it's a lot more complicated than that. And if you like, you can go back and see one of our previous videos on propositions and get a little more detail. Yeah, it's something that makes a claim about reality. So for example, Grizzly Adams had a beard. That is making the claim about reality. Reality is such that Grizzly Adams at one time had a beard. The principle of bivalence says that every proposition is either true or false, and there's no third option. So our proposition, Grizzly Adams had a beard, that's either true or false, and there's nothing else that it could be. Before we go any further, Let's stop here to talk a little bit about truth value. Now, the reason I wanted to explain about truth value in the first place is because a lot of times when I first start teaching logic students and I use that term truth value, I can see in their eyes, they're like, is that what I think it means? It's because this word value is kind of weird here. You know, when we say value, sometimes we mean stuff like, I really value your friendship. And that means something totally different than what we're talking about right here. Here, we're using the word value to mean something more like we use in algebra. So for example, consider the equation y equals 2x. I might say the value of x is 3. Now notice what I'm doing. I'm assigning a number value to a variable. So that's how we use the word value in math, we take one kind of a thing, a number, and we assign it to another kind of a thing, a variable. And notice also that this value assignment affects what value will be assigned to the other variable as well. I assign the number value three to X, so Y will be assigned the value six. Well, much like in math where we have one kind of a thing, a variable, and we assign a different kind of a thing, and we call that a value, right? And it's a number value in math. In logic, where we have one kind of a thing, a proposition, and we assign another kind of a thing, a truth value. And sometimes in logic, just like in math, the value that you assign to one thing will affect the value that another thing gets assigned. So for example, if I have the proposition A and B, and I assign the truth value true to that, well, then it's component proposition a will also get the value true. What does the principle of bivalence have to do with this? The principle of bivalence is really making two separate claims. First, that every proposition is going to get a truth value. We're gonna take all of our truth values and we're gonna assign them to each and every proposition. There won't be any that we leave out. And claim two is that the only truth values that we're gonna use are two, true and false. Now that's really the basic gist of what the principle of bivalence is all about. Every single proposition out there is gonna get either a true or a false. But you may have heard that the principle of bivalence has some kind of special relation to the law of excluded middle. The law of excluded middle typically says something like P or not P. Now in classical logic, that comes out to something like P is true or P is false. And that sounds exactly like what we just said with the principle of bivalence. What's the difference? Well, typically it's explained as the law of excluded middle is syntactic, it has to do with syntax, and the principle of bivalence is semantic, has to do with semantics. What do we mean when we say that the law of excluded middle is syntactic? Well, imagine this whole logic thing that we're doing. Imagine it's not really about propositions or truth values or anything like that. Imagine that it's just a board game that we get and you open up the box and you look inside and you see a bunch of pieces. Some of them are capital letters. Some of them are weird symbols. One of them is this little sideways looking L thing. Another one is almost kind of looks like a V. And we're not sure when we could use these different pieces. All we know that is when we are allowed to use the little sideways L, you put it in front of one of the capital letters. And I, I realize there are more compound propositions, but for the sake of this, let's ignore those. And we know that we can use a little game piece that looks like a V to attach two things together. We're not sure exactly when we get to do that, but we know we can do it. Well, the law of excluded middle would be like a rule that said, hey, whenever you have any capital letter, like let's say P, and you've got a second capital letter that's the same letter P, and you've already attached one of those sideways L's to it, well, you can put those two things together with a little V anytime you want to. The law of excluded middle would tell us that, yeah, for any of those capital letters, this move works. And notice we haven't talked about truth values we haven't talked about propositions or anything like that. We're looking at a basic structure of game pieces and rules. That's really what we mean by syntax. The law of excluded middle is really just looking at that bare bones structure. Now, when we say that the principle of bivalence is semantic, what we mean is something like this. I may have looked into that game box and looked at all those capital letters and thought, oh, okay, so I can sort of attach some of these together. 
Great, what the heck are they supposed to be again? With the principle of bivalence, I can sort of put some meat on those bones. I know that these capital letters stand for propositions and that V and that sideways L, those are ways of assigning truth values. So that is how the principle of bivalence is related to the law of excluded middle. Principle of bivalence is semantic, talking about propositions and truth values. Law of excluded middle is syntactic. It's talking more about the structure or form. Now, more on this relationship in just a little bit. But first, let's ask the question, why is this important in propositional logic in the first place? Why do we care about the principle of bivalence? Well, remember that we've defined our connectives as truth functional, and that means two things. Number one, they attach to previously existing propositions to create new propositions. And number two, they take the truth values of those component propositions that they're putting together and using that, they assign a truth value to the new proposition that they just made. For example, our connective not, that little sideways L, attaches to one component proposition, let's say P, to create a new compound proposition, not P, and it takes a truth value of the original proposition P and assigns a truth value to that not P. So if we assign the truth value true to P, then not P would be assigned false. Or if we assign the truth value false to P, then not P would get assigned a true. And this is the only things that our connectives are. So now let's think about it. If we had a proposition that wasn't assigned a truth value, you know, it wasn't true or false, and we try to connect it using our truth functional connectives, what the heck's gonna happen? Seems like we'll run into a problem there. The principle by valence makes sure that every one of those propositions has a true or a false assigned to it to make sure that this never happens. Now, propositional logic is all about seeing how these truth functional connectives relate to different propositions to each other. So, the principle of bivalence makes sure that these truth connectives work. Really, it makes sure that propositional logic works, or at least, as we'll see at the end of this video, classical propositional logic. Now back to the principle of bivalence and the law of excluded middle. You know, what's interesting is there are a number of ways that we can use that word or in English. For example, way number one, we might mean at most one of these options, possibly neither of them. So for example, let's say you wanna go shopping and you also wanna to go to your friend's house, but you got a lot of homework, your mom might say, well, you can go to the mall or you can go to your friends. Now notice she seems to mean here that you can choose one or the other, but not both, and she probably Probably would be fine with neither. So that's one way of using or to say at most one of these options, you don't get both of them, but possibly you don't have to use either one of them. Way number two, you would mean at least one, but possibly both of them. So for example, if you're applying for a job and it says for this job, you must speak either English or Spanish and you say, oh, I speak both of them. You'd be good, right? In this way of using the word or, we mean you have to have at least one of them. Having both of them is just fine, but having neither one of them, that's the problem. Now notice this is the way that we use the word or in logic and therefore this is the way we're using or in the law of excluded middle. When we say P or not P, what we're saying is you have to have at least one of those two guys. We're not saying that you can't have both of those guys. That would be the law of non-contradiction. The law of non-contradiction says not both P and not P. So it seems like the principle of bivalence being equivalent to the law of excluded middle means that the principle of bivalence isn't saying anything about having both true and false as your possible truth values. However, there is a third way that we can use this word or. Sometimes when we use the word or, we mean exactly one of these options, not both of them, and not neither of them. So look at the principle of bivalence one more time. Every proposition is either true or false. Now the problem here is, although way number two is a natural reading of the word or, it also seems to be very natural to read that word or in way number three here. That is to say, it's natural to read this as saying, every proposition is either true or it's false, but it is not both. And if that's the case, then now we have a third claim here. Claim number one was, every proposition is assigned a truth value. Claim number two was, there are only two truth values, true, or false. Claim number three here would be something like no proposition gets two truth values, or maybe just that no proposition is both true and false. Now personally, and I don't mean this offensively, but I don't really care how this is read. But notice that adding claim three, reading that or in this third way, would mean that the principle of bivalence is not equivalent to the law of excluded middle by itself. It would be equivalent to the law of excluded middle plus the law of non-contradiction. Now the law of non-contradiction is also true in classical propositional logic. So for us, there really is no problem. However, 
There are some philosophers and logicians that reject the law of non-contradiction, but not the law of excluded middle, or reject the law of excluded middle, but the not the law of contradiction, and they invent whole new logics using that. So for that reason, it's important to note that if the principle of bivalence is equivalent to the law of excluded middle, then it does not include claim number three here then we are reading that word or the second way that I was talking about. And if you want to do so, and if you want to keep those two things separate, and if you're worried about, well, I have a principle of bivalence to go with my law of excluded middle, but I have a law of non-contradiction and we don't have anything else over here. Well, some philosophers add another semantic rule, the principle of non-contradiction, and it goes something like, no proposition is both true and false. There you go, problem solved. Now I said that some philosophers reject the law of excluded middle, and you may wonder why? Like, doesn't it seem so obvious? true? Well, let's consider two cases in which it might not. The first one dates all the way back to Aristotle. It's a very famous example, and it's actually, I have entire books written about this. Future contingent propositions. Aristotle considers the proposition, there will be a sea battle tomorrow. And he asks the question, must this proposition be true or false? Well, imagine that it's true. If it's true, is it possible that there not be a sea battle tomorrow? Well, no right? Then it would have been false if there were no sea battle tomorrow. So if this proposition is true, then there has to be a sea battle tomorrow. And the same goes if this proposition is false. If this proposition is false, then there can't be a sea battle tomorrow. But when you think about future events, we typically think that they happen contingently. They don't have to happen, they could possibly happen or possibly not happen. So Aristotle says, if we're going with the principle of bivalence on future contingent propositions, it seems like all of a sudden we're saying there aren't future contingent propositions. They're all future necessary. So there's one problem people might have with the principle of bivalence. It says that we only have true or false and you have to be true or false. A second possible issue people have is that of vagueness, but which I don't mean something like ambiguity. This is a very specific problem in philosophy, the problem of vagueness. And a lot of times it's given as the paradox of the heap, but I prefer personally the paradox. I, I don't remember, there were two philosophers who wrote this paper. One of them I know is in UCI. I can't remember which ones they were, but they had this great example. Let's say you have 10,000 tiles all lined up nicely. And in front of each one of them, you have a red and a yellow bucket of paint. Now, for the first one, you dip your paintbrush in the red, you paint the whole thing red, leave it be. For the second one, you take an eyedropper to its yellow bucket and you drip one little dot into its red bucket. And you mix that all up and you paint that tile, good. For the second one, you take that same eyedropper and you go, two little yellow drops into its red bucket, mix that up, paint that guy. Three red drops, four red drops, all the way down to 10,000. Now, after all the tiles are nice and dry, we look at all of our tiles and the first one, I say, oh, look, this is a red tile. I look all the way down the line and I say, hey, check that one out down there. That's an orange tile. But here's what's interesting. And this, this is why I like this method of presenting the paradox. When you look at each tile, can you tell the difference between one tile and the next tile? No, right? you look at the two and they're gonna look exactly the same. And yet, as you look down, eventually you're gonna to get to a point where you're like, oh dude, it's starting to look orange, man, I don't know, right? But you're not really sure exactly which tile can be that spot where it all of a sudden turned orange because you can't even tell the difference between these tiles. This is the problem of vagueness on some predicates, on some things that we say are true of other things. We're not really sure where one of the predicates ends and the other one begins. And popular examples of this are baldness. When does a guy go bald? Is it when he loses one hair and then all of a sudden you're like, oh, he's bald now. A heap of sand. You start off with one grain of sand, add another grain of sand, do you have a heap? No, you throw another one on there, do we have a heap now? No, it seems like throwing a grain of sand on there isn't gonna make the difference between a non-heap and a heap. And yet at some point you're gonna have to say, I, I think we have a heap here. Or going in the reverse, starting with a heap of sand, taking away one grain and saying, do I still have a heap? Yeah, of course. Take one more, and do I still have a heap? Yeah. And you keep going down till you get to one grain of sand and all of a sudden you're like, well, clearly I don't have a heap anymore. The problem here doesn't seem to just be that I can't tell. The problem here seems to be that one grain of sand doesn't doesn't seem to make the difference. And yet we're going grain by grain and there's clearly a difference between the beginning and the end. So for our purposes, we're worried about propositions that contain vague terms. And again, I don't mean ambiguous terms. I don't mean we're not sure exactly what we're talking about. I mean like we're not sure when it applies or doesn't apply. If I'm looking down my line of tiles, I look at the first one that I consider the proposition, this tile is red, true. I look at the 10,000th one, this tile is red, false. Somewhere in the middle there, am I really going to say that 
I get to one tile, this tile is read true, the next tile that I can't even tell the difference from, this tile is read false. But given the principle of bivalence, I have to. I have to say each one of these propositions, all the 10,000s, have to be either true or false. And that kind of seems weird. How do we fix these problems? Well, one option we have is just to stick with the principle of bivalence and try to fix it some other way. So for example, in the case of future continued propositions, we would say, yes, they are true or false. Yes, a sea battle will happen tomorrow is true or false right now. But then we'd have to explain why that doesn't cause future events to happen necessarily. One popular solution to the vagueness problem that maintains the principle of bivalence is given by Timothy Williamson. There is like one point where it, the tiles, for example, go from being red to orange. We just don't know what that point is. A second possibility is that we reject the principle of bivalence altogether. And remember the principle of bivalence actually had two claims. The first of which was that all propositions have a truth value. So we could reject that claim. We could say that there are truth gaps. So for example, in the case of our future contingent propositions, we might ask, is it true that a sea battle will happen tomorrow? No. Oh, well then it's false? No, it's neither one. Right now, it lacks a truth value. Now, two days from now, when it's a past tense proposition, it will have a truth value. It will be either true or false. But right now, it doesn't have any truth value. The second claim that the principle of bivalence made was that we're only going to use true or false as our truth values. Some logics add more. These are called typically many-valued logics. So for example, in our future contingent propositions, uh, oh, uh, Jan Wukashevich. I, don't, I never know if I'm saying that right. If you're Polish, please help a brother out. But Jan, in the case of future contingent proposition, says, let's make a third truth value possible. So now we have true, false, or possible, and future contingent propositions get that value. In the case of vague terms, you could keep the values true and false, but then say there's like a percentage in between there. So when I get midway between red and orange, I could say, well, it's 50% true that this is red and it's 50% false that this is red. But notice, whatever you do, rejecting that principle of bivalence, you are rejecting classical propositional logic, which is why now we have non-classical logics. Logics that are gonna do pretty close to what we're doing right now, but they're gonna tweak things just a little bit so that you're gonna have a little bit different rules. But don't worry if you're looking at this like, oh my gosh, I have to learn all of these new logics. They are pretty similar to what we've got right now. In any case, that's the principle of bivalence, how it relates to the law of excluded middle, why it's important in propositional logic, and why people might have a problem with it. If you have any questions, please let me know in the comments. For next time, please read section 3.1, Truth Tables for the Connectives.